The Mighty Hood. She was the pride of the Royal Navy, from her commissioning in 1920 until the day she sank 80 years ago, on the 24th of May, 1941. Now, 80 years is certainly a milestone, but why am I commemorating a sinking? Why Hood? What makes her so important? Well, for one, the loss of the Hood shocked the British Admiralty and the nation, devastating morale and showing the Navy was not as invincible as it was in public perception. But for me, there's another reason she's so important, and that's in this little document kept by my great-grandfather. This time, on Castles and Curiosities, we're going to take a look at this mighty battlecruiser. HMS Hood was the only Admiral-class battlecruiser to be built for the Royal Navy. They were designed as a response to the powerful McKenton-class battlecruisers of the German Navy, the first of which was launched in 1917. However, the German project was cancelled, and the three hulls already launched were later broken up for scrap, although the British Admiralty didn't learn about this until after the war. Hood was laid down at Clydebank in Scotland in September of 1916, and her sister ships would begin construction elsewhere in the UK the same year. Anson, Howe, and Rodney were all suspended in March of 1917, while the designs underwent revision due to the severe losses at the Battle of Jutland, and they would later be cancelled in 1919, when the Admiralty decided the changes required were so extensive as to require a complete redesign. Despite this decision, Hood was far enough through construction to be completed, just in case the Germans managed to complete any of their new battlecruisers. Some of the design tweaks were incorporated into Hood during construction, which added 5,000 tonnes of extra armour and bracing. This left her very overweight, meaning she sat about 4 feet lower in the water than originally planned, and as a result, in heavy seas or at high speed, water would flow over her quarterdeck, and that's the lower section towards the stern, and down the ventilation shafts. I don't imagine anyone eating their lunch in the mess or sitting on one of the heads would have been too happy to have a sudden load of seawater dumped on them, but such was the result. And apparently, some of the sailors ended up dubbing her the largest submarine in the fleet. The ship was not named after Sir Horace Hood, who had died aboard HMS Invincible at the Battle of Jutland in 1916, but rather his ancestor, Lord Samuel Hood, 1st Vice Count Hood of Whiteley, who had served as the Lord of the Admiralty between 1788 and 1795. HMS Hood was launched at 1300 hours on the 22nd of August 1918, and who better to perform the launching than Lady Hood herself, widow of Sir Horace Hood. Following the launch, Hood would spend the next two years being fitted out, beginning sea trials in January of 1920. She was finally accepted from the builders and commissioned by the Royal Navy on the 15th of May. She had cost £6 million, which in today's money, that's actually about £300 million. But as you might know, that's still rather cheap by modern standards, and you'll see that in just a moment. She was the largest warship in the world at the time of her commissioning, and would hold that title for the next 20 years, until the completion of the Japanese battleship Yamato. She remained the largest warship built for the Royal Navy until the recently finished Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers, which by the way, cost a whopping £3 billion each. She was regarded by many as one of the finest looking warships ever built, but it was Hood's impressive size, speed and armament that led to her being seen as a symbol of the power and might of the Royal Navy, and indeed the British Empire, earning her the nickname, the Mighty Hood. Hood's very first role in the Royal Navy was as the flagship of the Battlecruiser Squadron, leading the two older battlecruisers HMS Renown and HMS Repulse. For much of the 1920s, she patrolled UK waters, occasionally heading out to training exercises in the Mediterranean and showing the flag around Spain, Brazil and the West Indies. Her most famous task in the 1920s was dubbed the Empire Cruise, or the World Cruise, by the public, and the World Booze by the sailors. In 1923 and 24, the battlecruisers Hood and Repulse joined the light cruisers Danae, Dauntless, Delhi, Dragon and Dunedin to form the Special Service Squadron. The squadron made ports of call in many parts of the British Empire and the United States, first departing His Majesty's naval base Devonport and heading to Africa in November of 1923. 
Of all the places they visited, of all the countries and cities, it was Hawaii that gave Hood and the Special Service Squadron the most trouble. The sailors were prevented from drinking due to American prohibition laws, and Hood's cricket team lost to the American baseball team. At cricket. The world booze briefly ended here. Later, on the 12th of July, as the squadron sailed for the Panama Canal, the cruiser squadron detached to sail around South America, while the battle cruisers continued through the canal to visit Jamaica before heading back towards Canada. Repulse and Hood passed through the Panama Canal on the 23rd, and for Hood at least, the passing was extremely tight. There are also tolls for passing through the canal, which are based on tonnage. HMS Hood would hold the record for the highest toll paid until the German ocean liner Bremen passed through the canal in 1938. It cost Hood $22,399.50, which today would be a whopping $344,525.27, or in real money, £251,322.36. When in Canada, while at Topsail Bay, Newfoundland, a Miss World beauty pageant was held aboard HMS Hood on the 19th of September. The winner was Miss Honolulu. Um, are you, are you really going to keep that one in? Steve, she won first place. HMS Hood and the squadron returned to the UK on the 29th of September 1924, clocking in at 38,152 miles, and with over a million visitors to the ships of the Special Service Squadron, the cruise was a highly successful public relations exercise for the British Empire, and it cemented Hood's position as the pride of the Royal Navy. In 1929, Hood entered a two-year-long major refit, upgrading her armour, fire control systems, and adding additional anti-aircraft guns. Hood's weapons and rangefinders would continue to be updated in smaller refits throughout the 1930s. In 1931, Hood rejoined the Battlecruiser Squadron, now under the command of Rear Admiral Wilfred Tomkinson, the man who over ten years prior had served as Hood's very first captain. Not long before he took command, Britain was hit by the Great Depression. With trade collapsing and profits plummeting, the government instituted emergency cuts to public spending, including the military, meaning Navy personnel now faced a 10% pay cut. For ratings below Petty Officer that had joined prior to 1925, those pay cuts could be as high as 25%. After arriving in Invergordon, Scotland, on the 11th of September, members of the crew found out about the incoming cuts cuts that would come into force in October. They had no time to prepare. On the 14th, mutinies began to break out aboard Hood, Dorsetshire, Rodney and Valiant. Tomkinson sent several telegrams to the Admiralty attempting to press the seriousness of the situation, but he received little word, other than the cuts would come into force in October and they were expected to continue their duties. Very, very helpful. Very helpful. By the morning of the 15th, all work had seized on board Hood and threats of breaking machinery had been made. Tomkinson again informed the Admiralty of the rapidly deteriorating situation. He would have to wait a full 24 hours for a reply. But when he did, the ships were ordered to proceed to their home ports. Those with family at Invergordon were granted leave to say their farewells, and the ships did eventually leave port as ordered. In the aftermath, the lower ratings pay was only cut 10% in line with the rest of the service. Those that organised the strike were jailed, and 200 other sailors were discharged. The Admiralty then held Tomkinson accountable for the mutiny, blaming him for failing to punish dissidents after the first protests. Back in the intro to this video, I mentioned my great-grandfather. Robert Alfred Avis joined the Royal Navy in October of 1929 at the age of 18. He served first as a stoker on the cruiser HMS Effingham, the aircraft carrier HMS Courageous, as well as briefly aboard the ageing dreadnought HMS Iron Duke, before he then joined the Hood in June of 1936. For those wondering, a stoker is someone specialised in engine room duties. Originally the term referred to those who would shovel coal into the boilers, but by 1912 all newly built Royal Navy ships had oil boilers, so stokers gained a broader engineering purpose, managing propulsion, hydraulics, electrics and other maintenance tasks. Robert would remain aboard Hood more or less constantly for the next five years. He was on board when Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September, 1939. The ship was nearing 20 years old at this point, and with glaring faults growing from near constant use as the Royal Navy flagship, Hood was well overdue modernization. Plans were drawn up, but with other ships in greater need, 
Hood wasn't scheduled for such an upgrade until 1942, and the outbreak of war was making that estimated time frame rather sketchy. Nevertheless, Hood joined the Home Fleet Battled Cruiser Squadron, patrolling around Iceland and the Faroe Islands. On the 26th of September 1939, while attempting to recover the damaged submarine Spearfish, Hood was hit by a 500 pound bomb dropped by a Yonkers 88, damaging her port torpedo bulge and the condensers for her steam turbines. By 1940, she was in dire straits. Her machinery was in such poor condition her top speed was down from 32 knots to just 26. She had a very brief refit and repair before joining Force H in June under the command of Admiral James Somerville, and it was shortly after this she'd see her first major engagement, one that remains controversial to this day. After the French surrender, many French ships were moored in various ports in Britain, Alexandria, and in French Algeria, with their most modern and powerful stationed at a port in Oran. The French Navy was the second largest in the world, with the Royal Navy of course being the largest. With Italy now in the war as well, the balance of power in the Mediterranean had begun to shift heavily against Britain, especially as Britain's navy was spread out defending the global empire. Churchill was concerned that with the French surrender, the French navy would fall into the hands of Germany, tilting the scales even further. When the terms of the armistice were seen, his fears were realised. Hitler had ordered that French ships outside home waters must return and would be placed under German control. But the French had his solemn promise they would not be used. Though, given his earlier solemn promises, such as not invading Czechoslovakia or Poland, Churchill understandably didn't believe it. Determined not to allow the Germans any opportunity to take control of the French fleet, Churchill ordered Force H and HMS Hood to the port of Merz el Kabir in Oran to issue an ultimatum to the French ships. Everything around this operation, from the politics to the negotiations themselves, is far too complex to cover within this video. This is meant to be one just on Hood, after all. But I will be tackling it very soon, so if you're interested, make sure you subscribe. For now, suffice to say, that on the evening of the 3rd of July, 1940, HMS Hood and the other ships of the battle group opened fire on the French. 15-inch shells from Hood, Resolution and Valiant pounded the battleship Britannia until her magazines exploded and the ship capsized. The British ships then trained their fire on the Dunkirk and Provence. For over 10 minutes, the British fleet fired upon sailors that just days prior had been their allies. The battleship Strasbourg and several destroyers attempted to flee towards Toulon, and Hood would strip one of her turbines in the chase, once again limiting her top speed. Admiral Somerville eventually called off the chase, and by the end of the attack, battleship Britannia had been sunk and several others had been badly damaged. 1,297 French sailors were dead. I don't know how my great-grandfather would have felt, below decks as the attack took place hearing the explosive thuds of Hood's powerful guns shuddering through the ship, but I'd like to believe he thought of it in much the same way Admiral Somerville did. I just felt so damned angry being called on to do such a lousy job. We all feel dirty and ashamed that the first time we have been in action was an affair like this. In August, Hood was relieved as the flagship of Force H. She then spent the next several months patrolling for German commerce raiders. In January of 1941, she was taken in again for another refit, lasting until March, modernising her radar and rebuilding the turbines damaged when chasing the Strasbourg. She needed to stay in for much longer, but the Royal Navy could not afford time for a major overhaul until more of the King George V class battleships came into service. They needed Hood's guns. On the 16th of March, the ship and her company were inspected by King George VI, and this would also be the day my great-grandfather departed the ship for the last time. So great was the need for Hood, the day immediately after her refit was finished, she was sent out to try and intercept the battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. Failing to find them, Hood was then ordered to patrol around the Bay of Biscay for any German ships attempting to break out from Brest. And on the 19th of April, the Admiralty received reports that the German battleship Bismarck had sailed from Germany. Bismarck was the newest German battleship and of great concern to the Royal Navy. She and her sister ship Tirpitz would be the largest ships built by Germany during the war, equipped with thick armour, advanced radar and fire control equipment, and eight newly developed 15-inch guns. Were she allowed to break out into the North Atlantic, she would wreak havoc on the vital convoys supplying Britain. 
Hood was quickly ordered to the Norwegian Sea to intercept the ship before she could reach the Atlantic. However, the reports turned out to be false, so Hood would then return to Scapa Flow on the 6th of May. On the 12th, Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland, commander of the Battlecruiser Squadron and second in command of the Home Fleet, set up his command aboard Hood, with the ship captained by Ralph Kerr. During my research, a surprising name appeared at this point, as one of the sailors aboard Hood. One John Pertwee, perhaps better known to some of you as the third Doctor in BBC's Doctor Who. Yeah, <laughs> really. He had joined the ship in November of 1940 after training at HMS Collingwood in Fareham, and he was one of the lucky few to disembark in the days leading up to Hood's departure. On the 20th of May, the British Admiralty heard news. Bismarck had been spotted sailing through the Baltic Sea by the Swedish cruiser Gotland. An RAF reconnaissance Spitfire confirmed the report when the ship stopped in German-occupied Norway for supplies. Bismarck, under the command of Admiral Luchens, had expected to sail with several other ships for Operation Reinebong, attacking British supply lines. However, Tirpitz was still on sea trials, Scharnhorst and Gneisenau were undergoing refits and repairs, and the heavy cruisers Admiral Hipper and Admiral Scheer were delayed by British air attacks. Bismarck's only available support was the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen. Catching the ships now, before they could reach the North Atlantic, was Britain's best chance. The Royal Navy had already sent ships out to cover likely routes, with HMS Norfolk and HMS Suffolk covering the Denmark Strait. On the 23rd, Suffolk made contact. HMS Suffolk was equipped with a powerful radar that allowed her to track Bismarck while staying out of range from her guns, and she would continue to shadow the German ships through the strait. HMS Hood, HMS Prince of Wales, and six destroyers under the command of Vice Admiral Holland were already heading to the south of Iceland. And receiving news from Suffolk, they increased speed in an attempt to quickly intercept the German ships. In doing so, they gradually left their destroyer escorts behind, struggling against the heavy seas. HMS Prince of Wales was the newest ship for the Royal Navy, a King George V-class battleship only in commission since January. She still had civilian contractors on board to help with ironing out issues with the guns. Vice Admiral Holland had hoped to engage head-on with Bismarck at approximately 0200 hours of the 24th of May, but shortly after midnight, Suffolk lost contact for around 90 minutes. During this time, Bismarck and Prince Eugen had slightly adjusted their course to follow the Greenland ice pack, and crucially, the two ships had swapped places in the formation due to an issue with Bismarck's radar. At 0300, Suffolk regained contact. Hood and Prince of Wales steered towards the Germans. However, they'd no longer be able to carry out the attack in the manner Holland had planned. At 0535, lookouts aboard Prince of Wales sighted the German ships, just 15 nautical miles away. Holland now aimed for a sharp approach towards Bismarck, hoping to close the distance quickly, reducing the risk of plunging fire onto Hood's weaker deck armour, and to hopefully increase the accuracy of the range and direction finders, which were being impacted by heavy spray. However, this left the aft turrets unable to fire, halving the guns he could bring to bear on the Bismarck. Rapidly closing the gap at a speed of 29 knots, at 0552, HMS Hood opened fire. Hood's opening salvos targeted the lead ship, Prince Eugen, mistaking it for Bismarck. Aboard Prince of Wales, the mistake was noticed quickly, changing targets to the second ship. As the distance continued to close, Hood realised the mistake, Admiral Holland ordering the change of target. The German ships, however, made no such mistake. At 0555, as Hood and Prince of Wales completed a turn to port, Bismarck and Prince Eugen returned fire, all their guns aimed at Hood. The first salvo fell short, the second between Hood and Prince of Wales, and the third appeared to straddle Hood. A shell from Prince Eugen struck Hood near the base of the mainmast, and started a fire which quickly began setting off the ammunition stored in the ready-use lockers there. Captain Kerr ordered the fire to be left until the ammunition had been expended. Another shell went through the spotting top, with bodies of the observers falling onto the compass platform below. Now receiving accurate fire from the Germans, but not yet scoring any hits of their own, at 0559, Admiral Holland ordered his ships to turn to port a second time to open up the aft turrets. This is the last manoeuvre Hood would ever make. As she began the turn, Bismarck's fifth salvo struck somewhere between the main mast and rear funnel. A geyser of flame shot to the sky, and moments later there was a massive explosion as the ship disappeared amid an enormous cloud of smoke. As the crew scrambled to their feet, a report came up the voice pipe that the steering gear was lost. But no sooner had Captain Kerr ordered to change to emergency steering, Hood began listing heavily to port. 
No order to abandon ship was given. In the words of a survivor, it wasn't needed. And the crew began to leave their stations, climbing off the ship. For moments, the cannon fire ceased as Hood split in two. Her stern rose vertically and sank quickly. The bow began to rise sharply, but before she sank, likely either for a secondary explosion or a malfunction, a turret appeared to fire one last salvo. And then, just ten minutes after entering the battle, HMS Hood slipped beneath the waves, taking with her the lives of 1,415 men. Only three would survive. Able seaman Robert Tilburn had been taking shelter as the explosion killed two nearby shipmates. One was simply blown away, and the other butchered by splinters. As he went to throw up over the side of the ship, he saw the bow rising. He took a moment to strip off his anti-flash gear, oil skins and overcoats, gear that would make swimming difficult, and by the time he had done so, the water was around him. Swimming away, he was struck by the mast, and one of her radio aerials wrapped around his foot. As it pulled him under, he managed to cut off his boot with his knife, freeing him. Midshipman William Dundas and signalman Ted Briggs were both on the bridge decks. Dundas escaped by climbing up the now sloping deck and through a window. As he was part way through, the water came up underneath him, lifting him through and leaving him swimming in the water. As Ted Briggs moved to abandon the compass platform, the flag lieutenant ahead of him stood aside, allowing Briggs to pass through. According to Briggs, Vice Admiral Holland remained in his seat as Captain Kerr attempted to stand beside him. The ship was sinking so rapidly that Briggs found himself half submerged as he started down the ladder and as he tried to swim, the pull of the water flooding into Hood pulled Briggs under. He fought to swim up, but the suction was too strong, until something, perhaps a sudden release of air from a sealed section of the ship, propelled him to the surface. Briggs watched as the bow disappeared under the waves. The three men waited for rescue in the freezing water, William Dunder singing songs to keep Tilburn and Briggs awake. After three and a half hours, they would eventually be picked up by HMS Electra, one of Hood's destroyer escorts who had raced to the area after hearing the news. Electra had arrived expecting hundreds of survivors, and had readied countless warm blankets and cups of tea ready to care for them. I can't imagine how it would have felt to find so few. Back aboard Prince of Wales, there was a stunned silence as Hood had vanished in a fireball. Finding themselves heading straight for the stricken battlecruiser, Captain Leach ordered an emergency turn to avoid it, but this put her in a position easier for the German gunners. She was hit several times by both Bismarck and Prinz Eugen, one shell passing through the bridge, killing all but Captain Leach, the chief yeoman of signals, and the navigating officer. Alone, damaged, with malfunctioning guns, and now the target of both German ships, Captain Leach decided to lay down smoke and disengage from the battle. Despite several of the guns jamming, throughout the engagement three salvos from Prince of Wales had struck Bismarck. One shell put a hole in her bow, rendering 1,000 tonnes of fuel unusable. Another hit the commander's boat and the seaplane catapult. The third burst inside the ship, flooding a generator room and one of the boilers. The leaking fuel and reduced speed would ultimately lead to the Bismarck's destruction. But that's another story. After the sinking, there were two boards of inquiry to investigate what led to the loss of Hood. Both came to the conclusion that the sinking of Hood was due to a hit from Bismarck's 15-inch shell in or adjacent to Hood's 4-inch or 15-inch magazines, causing them all to explode and wreck the after part of the ship. There are a number of modern theories on what caused Hood to explode, and for more on that I highly recommend this video by Drakinefell. A link is in the description below. In 2001, an expedition funded by UK's Channel 4 found the wreck of HMS Hood. And for the first time in 60 years, human eyes once again gazed upon Britain's mighty battlecruiser. She lies on the seabed in three pieces, about 9,000 feet down. Her stern rises sharply in the water, and her rudder can be seen locked in her last turn to port. With Hood discovered and the wreck examined, the team and the last survivor of Hood, Ted Briggs, lowered a memorial plaque onto the seabed beside the bow. In 2015, another expedition managed to recover one of HMS Hood's bells, one that had been gifted to the ship by Lady Hood in 1918. The two inscriptions read, This bell was preserved from HMS Hood Battleship, 1891-1914, to by the late Honourable Sir Horace Hood, killed at Jutland, 31st of May 1916, and, in accordance with the wishes of Ladyhood, it was presented in memory of her husband to HMS Hood Battlecruiser, the ship she launched 22nd of August 1918. The bell can now be found at the National Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth. By sheer luck, 
my great-grandfather had managed to avoid the devastating loss of Hearn, being drafted off just weeks before she sailed for her battle with Bismarck. He served the rest of the war aboard HMS Ramsey, an old US destroyer transferred to the Royal Navy in 1940. He left the Navy in April of 1953 after 24 years of service and went to work in Portsmouth Dockyard living the rest of his life in the city. He never forgot his time on Hood and was proud to have served aboard her. Loads of photos and models of the ship could be found around his house and some of the newspaper clippings and pictures within this video are among those he kept safe. Robert sadly passed away in 2004 at the age of 82. He lost many friends on that day and among them his brother-in-law, Leslie Frank Ship, a stoker first class who had just joined Hood as his very first ship. As a stoker himself, he would have been in the very bows of the ship when the explosion ripped her in two, dying along with the other 1,400 men. He was just 21. His name, along with all the others, can be found on the various memorials around the country. Very recently, we made a discovery. A collection of letters my great-grandfather had addressed to Leslie, dated through May 6th to the 11th. And mostly him complaining about moving to the old US destroyer, about how it would roll about even in calm waters. But it also talks about how he really missed the big ship, and how he wished he was back on board. He never got the chance to send them. My family connection to Hood has given me an intense love and fascination for this ship, but it's given me something else as well. A consideration for those we so often forget about when talking about naval warfare. The ones below decks, the ones managing the ammunition stores, the ones keeping the engines and the boilers working. The ones with no chance of escape should the worst ever happen.